the witness, the permitter, the supporter, the experiencer, the great Lord and the supreme self. This is a very important verse. What does God do? God says that his work is not just one. In the game of the Prakriti nature and the Purush, the soul that is going on, even God plays different parts. How? God has said six different parts. The witness, the permitter, the supporter, the experiencer, the great Lord and the supreme self. The supreme soul does all of this. The Purush, the soul, resides in the body, but it is beyond the body. Purusha asmin dehe sita api paraha asmin dehe api paraha dehe asmin purusha paraha purusha asmin dehe api paraha. The substance of God resides in the body and yet it is beyond the body. What then does the supreme soul do? God says that he has many different parts. How? First, he is the witness. The word used for witness is upadrashta, meaning one who sits above and looks. God is there as a witness. This is the first state of life. If you are performing grand wisdom, bhakti, devotion or anything else, then at the beginning, the supreme soul is just the witness. When you wish to do good deeds and perform good deeds, then the supreme soul is watching this. If you wish to do wrong deeds and perform wrong deeds, then the supreme soul does not hold a hand. He is the upadrashta, the witness. He is there as a witness. Of course, something inside it will try and stop you and say that you're doing wrong and that you should refrain from doing it. If you hear this and stop, then it is fine. But if you do not stop, then God does not come to hold your hand. Because we are dharmic and we say that God resides in everyone, people living a material life ask the question that, is it true? Does God therefore even reside in these robbers, these thieves, people doing, going downhill and criminals? Yes, God is even in them. If God is in everyone, then God has to be in them. Then they will immediately ask the question, why do all of these people do wrong deeds? Why do thieves go out to rob people? Why do murderers murder people? Why do these people commit crimes if God resides within them? And while they're committing crimes, then what is your good God doing at that time? God is upadrashta, witness. God describes his state in this verse. When I was talking to a great saint, he told me something very nice about this. We all accept that God helps us when we do good deeds and that we perform any satkarma divine act and do it with our hearts, then it will get help from somewhere. Therefore, our satkarma, our divine acts, grows by this much. And we say that I did not even know about this. This is God's grace. God has helped us and has happened very nicely. But what about at the time of doing wrong things? Whenever somebody is doing wrong things, uh, performs something wrong, then where does God go? Does this mean that God must be helping him as well? The great saint analyzed this very nicely, that in God's diary there is nothing like right and wrong. We have determined all of these standards that this is right and this is wrong. For God, there is only karma actions and that is it. And each and every karma actions has a reaction. Therefore, God's accounts are very clear that if there is a karma, an action, then a reaction will come. Who are we to determine what is right and wrong? Before, during my discourses, I used to give an example. That let us say you're standing at the train station. It's 11 p.m. at Barbican Station or 11.30 p.m. at night and you have to go somewhere for an urgent task because somebody has suddenly fallen ill and you have to go there. You're standing there and it turns 12 a.m. at midnight. This is when the tube strike are not on. At 12 a.m. there is nobody else at the station but some people who hang around on the roads. It is 10 or 15 minutes until the train is going to come and you're standing there. You see a person coming towards you and it looks as if he is mad. He's climbing down a bridge and he's coming towards you. He has messed up hair, his clothes are not right, his eyes are red, and he starts swearing very loudly about a person. You see such a person coming towards you, he comes and stands next to you. You notice him, but he does not notice you. You see the train coming, but it uh, honks, honks the horn and shines a light. You get up from your bench to catch the train. As soon as the train comes close, then the person next to you tries to jump onto the platform to be squashed under the train. He is making an effort to commit suicide and you realize he's about to commit suicide. You see that he's about to jump and therefore you grab hold of his hand. He tries to pull his hand back and tells you that he wants to jump underneath the train. You tighten your grip of his hand and you don't let him fall under the platform. He asks you at the beginning why you stopped him and what are you doing. He even swears at you two or four times, but you don't want him to die. The train goes and you miss the train. 
You make him sit down and ask him why he's trying to kill himself. You tell him that God has given him such a nice body and ask him why he's throwing away the body. After five or ten minutes, you tell him nice things and give him water to drink. He realizes that his suicidal thoughts were a spare of a moment thing and he calms down and brings himself back to normal. He thanks you for saving his life and he says that he's very grateful to you. He says that he will now not commit suicide and goes away. The next train comes and you catch it and you go home. The question that I want to ask you, that when you have saved this person from committing suicide, did you do something good or bad? Who thinks that you did something good? Who thinks that you did something bad? Okay, most of you think that you did something good. You say that you did something good because you saved someone's life. A week goes and you pick up a newspaper. You see a photo of the person whose life you saved on a front page and the report says that this person killed four people in one family. Everything is written in the report that he had enmity with a family and that he had had difficulties for a long time. He could not do anything and he felt that the other people were annoying him a lot. He became so frustrated because these people were annoying him that he tried to commit suicide. But someone saved him from being squashed on the train tracks. In this newspaper it is written that someone saved him but we know that someone is us because we saved his life. It says in the report that somebody saved him and that this person went home and thought that let us say that I'd gone on the tracks today, I would have died. He then decides that I will die, but I will die after killing these four people. The report goes on further to say that he had made preparations for a week and bought a knife from somewhere. He had then got into the other person's house and killed all four of them. He then went to surrender himself to the police saying that I've done all of this so you should hang me. Now tell me that when you saved that person's life a week ago, did you do something good or bad? Who thinks you did something good? <laughs> oh, something bad. Who thinks you did something bad? <laughs> because if you had not saved him, then he may have died, but these four people would have been saved. You saved one life, but four lives went. If you had not saved him, then would four people not have been saved? They would have been saved, Therefore, have we done the right thing by saving him, or have we done the wrong thing? Now, it feels as if we have done the wrong thing. What I mean to say is that no action can be prima facie right or wrong. It is a kiddish attitude that we merely sit in the chair of the judge and say that this is wrong action and this is the right action. Just look at the development of the world and look at the great history of the world and you realize that you cannot really tag the actions. You cannot really label them that this is a right action and this is a wrong action. This is a kiddish attitude. What could be a good for us could be bad for the person next to us. If 10 to 12 youngsters get together for a night and are playing music at maximum volume, then while they're dancing and jumping, then they find it's very good. Is that karma of theirs good or not? But the sleep of the person living next to them is ruined. Is this good or bad? This one karma was enjoyed by 10 to 12 people, but it annoyed the person next to them. Therefore, a karma can never be right or wrong. In God's diary, there is no box that says that something is right and something is wrong. No. A action is an action, a karma is a karma, and a supreme soul is seeing that these arrangements that, where one, that will get the reaction of what one is doing. Then how does God see all of this? Remember, first of all, that we ourselves decide to do wrong actions, and there is no such thing as wrong action for the supreme soul. Logically speaking, there can be no such thing as a wrong action. There is no such thing as a right action and no such thing as a wrong action. An action is just an action. A karma is just a karma. In the example that I gave earlier, a right action became a wrong action. It can also be so that a wrong action can become a right action in the long term. There are examples of this throughout history. A very great saint has told me this himself. He told me that his father is not alive today, but his father lived a very pure life and a dharmic life. This is around 55 years before today. When he was young, his father's leg had to be cut off. He got a small infection and it turned out to be diabetes. It got so serious that his leg had to be cut off. At that moment, this great saint thought a lot about it, that my father is living such a dharmic life, he has not done anything wrong to anyone. Why is his leg being cut off? Why does he have to tolerate this pain? Why does he have to be put in this state? This is injustice. This should not happen to him. He found it very bad at the time. Then around 20 years passed and his father reached an old age where he had a heart attack. 
The doctor gave him treatment, and when the doctor investigated this, then the doctor found out that his heart was so weak that the fact that the heart attack came to him at that time meant that the heart attack came very late. His heart was so weak. The doctors themselves found it so strange how this person was able to live for so long with such a weak heart. After consulting four or five doctors, they found out and they told the great saint that his father would not have been able to live for long because his heart was so weak. But the reason why he was able to live for so long because his leg was cut off early in his life. This was because the blood that would have had to be circulated in that leg no longer needed to be circulated there and the heart got that much less strain. It led to much less of a burden to the heart and as a result of the fact that his leg got cut off, they told him that this was the reason why his father was able to live for 15 to 20 years more. At that time, the great saint realized that this was the grace of God. At that time, the leg went away. The great saint thought that something uh, wrong had happened. But when he found out about this 20 years later, then he thought that it was a good thing that the leg got cut off because the leg went away, but at least his father remained for 20 years more. What I mean to say is that there can be no karma, action that is right or wrong. A karma, an action is only a karma, action. What then does God do? God does only one thing. He looks at the involvement of the human being. Let us now put the labels of right and wrong to one side. In any action, if you have forgotten the whole world and have become totally involved in that work, then the power of the Supreme Soul begins to help you in its complete totality. I repeat again, if you, in any action, if you have forgotten the whole world and you have become totally involved in that work, then the power of the Supreme Soul begins to help you in its complete totality. And psychologists have proved this thing. This applies to both that which we call right actions and wrong actions in this world. Criminals were asked that when they went to commit crimes, then what was going through their minds at that time? They replied that nothing was going on in their minds. They said that they were going to commit violence towards someone and they just did not want that person in the world. They said that whatever was going to happen to them will happen to them later, but they did not want that person to remain in the world. They had total involvement in it. The power of the Supreme Soul reached there. And even with a person committing right deeds, if they do it with total involvement, that I want to do this work, come what may, then the power of the Supreme Brahman reaches there. Dehem pata yami apa karyam sada yami. My body may break, but I will attain the goal that I have set. This is because for God, the karma, the action, is just a karma, an action. Towards the consequences, God is the Upadrasha, the witness. One should have the feeling of God being a witness. Upadrasha also means a witness nearby. The Supreme Soul is just a witness. The Supreme Soul just watches everything. But then, is God so completely dry that he has nothing to do with anything? Is it like this? God says, no, it is not like this. Then, the Lord says that you should perform satkarma, divine acts, because if your activity is right, and if you're coming to God with your karma actions, then God says that I myself change my costume and take on a new role of mine in this play of the Purush, the soul and Prakriti nature. At the beginning, I was just there as the Upadrasha, the witness, looking at everything from the wing inside, but I feel that you are coming towards me and you're trying to become mine and I immediately become the Anumanta, the next one, Vamita. This is the second state that comes. Anumanta means one who gives encouragement, so that one does not lose their stomach to work. God becomes this. The difference is made there. God is in wrong people, but God is only in these people as the Upadasha, the witness. For people doing good deeds, God changes his field a little and becomes the Anumanta, the permitter. That is why God says from within wherever, whether the work is right or wrong. When one is about to commit a wrong deed, then God says do not do it. And when one is about to do a good deed, then one gets bliss from the inside that I am doing a right deed and my God is getting happy. God is the Anumanta, the permitter. One who has experienced the bliss will know that one who is performing activities to go near towards God will know what nice blessings the supreme, that what nice permissions the supreme soul gives from the inside. When a child learns to walk and is taking the steps right, then the mother stands there and says, "Yes, son, that is right. Yes, come on, come on, son." The supreme soul says it in the same thing, same way that the mother is saying. God becomes the anumanta, the permitter. When you begin to perform satkarma divine acts one after another, then God becomes the Anumanta, the permitter. Then God says that he takes a third field where he becomes the Bharta, the supporter. 
God supports the perform, person performing Satkarma, divine acts. When the child begins to take bigger steps, then the mother goes two steps further and picks up the child. The mother becomes the parta, the supporter, and picks up the child. When the devotee continues to perform Satkarma, then God feels that now I do not stand there inside and clap my hands. It, it won't work like this. And if I just keep giving permission and confirmation, then it also won't work. God becomes the Bartha, the supporter. God becomes the giver of power to this devotee. If a wise person or devotee is performing good <coughs> deeds and their power is reducing, then God becomes the Bartha, the supporter, and completes that power. The fourth field is Bhokta, the experiencer. When there is a wise devotee or a devotee who is a karma yogi, a person on a path of actions, then when he performs satkarma divine acts, he knows that he is not going to keep those satkarma himself. This is because the devotee puts the fruit he is getting from the satkarma by the Supreme Soul and says that, Lord, this is yours. Everything I have is yours. For these fruits of karma that come, God becomes the bhokta, the experiencer. God accepts the fruit of karma. Then the state comes when God becomes the Maheshvara, the great Lord. This is the field of Maheshvara, the great Lord. Maheshvara can be split into the two words, Maha, great, and Ishvara, Lord, to become Maheshvara, the great Lord. One who is the God of the gods is Maheshvara, the great Lord. One who is all-controlling is Maheshvara, the great Lord. One who is totally and completely glorious is Maheshvara, the great Lord. When God reaches the level of Maheshvara, the great Lord, in a person's life, then that person never has anything wrong in their lives, never does anything wrong in life, no work of their stops. You never see the emotion of sorrows on their face, and you never see the emotion of complaint on their face. They never have any complaint. This is when God in them reaches the level of Maheshvara, the great Lord. This is because everything is controlled by Him with a capital H. Everything is controlled by the Lord. This is Maheshwara, the great Lord. Then the highest level comes, which is that of the Paramatma, the Supreme Self. This is the Shubh Satchitanan Gan Paramatma, the Supreme Self who is existence, wisdom, bliss. In the last level, God was Maheshwara, the great Lord, and the owner, and now there is a little difference. When the devotee reaches a peak state, then the individual soul and the Supreme Soul become one. The bindu becomes the sindhu. The drop becomes the ocean. The no curtain remains. This is the paramatma, the supreme self. These are the different fields of God. Let us take the next verse, verse 23. Yeah.